Welcome to the UNM HealthCast. I'm Elizabeth Dwyer Sandlin, and today we are joined by four awesome guests who are going to talk to us about the anatomical donor program at UNM. And Dr. Julie Jordan is joining us, who's the clinical physical therapist and anatomy instructor for the UNM School of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Jordan. Hi, it's nice to be here and join you guys for this conversation. Thanks so much. We're really happy to have you. Um, We also have Amy Rosenbaum, who's a licensed funeral director and embalmer and director of the UNM Anatomical Donation Program. Thanks so much for being here, Amy. Thank you for having me. And then we also have uh, two medical students joining us, which is a really great, fun addition to the program. We have Devin Mays, who is a second year medical student and president of the Surgical Interest Group. Thanks so much for joining us, Devin. Happy to be here. Thank you, Elizabeth. And then we also have Alyssa Yaki, who is our first year medical student and is going to speak to us about her experience with the anatomical donation program. Thanks so much for joining us, Alyssa. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so let's kick this off with um, just some real basics here. What is the UNM Anatomy Lab exactly? We have a program here at the university that you can actually donate your body for medical education, and you can call our office or go on our website to sign up for our program. You do have to register yourself, and we take in, usually in a good year, 60 to 70 donors into our program to use. Unfortunately, uh, this year we only have 18 so far, so we really have a shortage of donors. So we want to get the word back out there that we're open because we were closed down for a a period during pandemic. And uh, we just want to get the word out there that this is an awesome program and that we do need donors um, to to join in helping medical education. So what does medical education in the anatomy lab um, look like? Like what are students doing and learning um, with these cadavers that people have so generously donated? So the program serves um, students in the School of Medicine, which includes the um, physician training program, the physician assistant, physical therapy and occupational therapy programs. And the students come in, um, it's one of their first courses in their medical education. And it's foundational to almost everything else they learn beyond that. They come in and in groups of four or five, They each are assigned a donor or a cadaver, and they dissect this person and learn the anatomy thoroughly, hands-on, and they learn everything that there is to know about the body. So I want to hear um, a little bit from Julie or Amy about this question, and then I would love to have um, Devin and Melissa speak to it as well. But why is that important? Like, what does that do for the medical students who are in the lab building this foundation? So I think when you look at the um, textbooks and the anatomy atlases, you will see what is typical um, in terms of uh, the, the arteries, the veins, the, the um, organs, where they are in the relationships to one another. But when you actually look in an individual human body, you will see tremendous variation And so if we only study from books or from images that should be the way people present, you won't learn and appreciate the tremendous variability. And then when you're treating in the clinic, you don't have that perspective and it gives you that that perspective that everyone is different and treat them as individuals. So Devin and or Alyssa, what is it like? What is the difference between looking at diagrams or, you know, even 3D models versus an actual human body. How has that experience been for both of you? I think that when you are working with your donors, they're, you're able to move things in ways that aren't really, you're not able to do that on um, like models or in a book. You can't really move things and see how they orient, how muscles contract. You can do that in a donor. And so it's really a hands-on learning that kind of sticks in your brain. I remember so many times going to a test and remembering, I saw this in my donor and I remember that this happens, like this motion happens when you move the arm or this motion happens when you move the leg or this artery goes this way underneath this structure. So it's just really, really helpful to give you a 3D version that really isn't, uh, you aren't able to get in a book or even in a model. So I think 
it's just tremendously helpful in that way. Awesome. And Devin, is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah. Um, so I had a pretty unique experience with the anatomy lab. So I'm a second year medical student. We started our medical school in the summer of 2020, right when the pandemic was heating up. So our instructors had to use a modified online um, program to, to teach us anatomy. And we still got to get into the lab, but just for brief periods of time in smaller groups. So we essentially missed out a little bit on that hands-on experience that the now first years and prior medical medical school classes got to experience. And so I, that was one of the reasons I really liked joining the surgical interest group because traditionally they go into the lab every every fall to help act as TAs for for the anatomy portion of the course, which was really great because not only did we get to actually get into the lab for essentially the first time, we got to utilize um, and learn a lot of the structures that we had some issues with, I guess, initially. I mean, like Alyssa was alluding to, there's just an aspect that's, that you can't learn in a textbook. I think, especially when you're when you're interested in surgery, understanding anatomy and that 3D relationships of the structures with one another is extremely important because obviously you don't want to injure your patient. You want to have a very, uh, very solid grasp on, on what you're working with. So I think working with cadavers is essential to doing that. And like Alyssa said, that is not something you can learn in the textbook. It is something that we tried to replicate online, but it is just some, simply not matched unless you get in there and work with your hands. So I was grateful to be able to do that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And Amy, can you speak a little bit to why this current shortage is happening? Is it related to the pandemic? Do you have a sense of, of why there's such a difference in the sheer you know, lack of volume that you're experiencing this year in donations? Right. I wish we knew the answer to that question because then we could we could fix it. I think a lot of it had to do that we did have to sh shut down for an extended period of time. And then as the virus progressed, people got stressed, worried, and I think they kind of forgot about us. And I want to make sure that they know that we're back open. We are limited to where we can take people from. So right now we're only taking a 60 mile radius of Albuquerque. Albuquerque and Santa Fe areas. We used to be open to the whole state. We are working on different contracts to get people in from further. Staffing issues are really huge uh, with a lot of departments that we work with. Everybody's been hit. Uh, it's just kind of been devastating over the board. The other thing that we're seeing is that we, right now for safety reasons, if they actively die from COVID, we can accept them into our program. So that limits our pool of people that we can accept as well. So we've just had all of these obstacles one after another come up and we're just trying to figure out how we can move forward. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Sounds like a perfect storm of creating a, a shortage for, for the lab. So we'll get to a little bit more later about how people can help and what folks might do who are watching and listening to the program. Uh, but, but before we get there, let's talk a little bit about the journey of a cadaver. If someone does decide to donate their body to science, to medical study, specifically wants to land at the UNM anatomical donation program, what does that look like? What happens to their body and what from like, you know, how are they received and then studied and then what happens after? So a lot of people, we want them to get thinking too about the end of times. <laughs> they need to prepare for it. So they do need to register and sign up with us. So that's step one. They need to call us, talk with us, understand the rules of our program, what our mission here is at university, and sign up with us. And it's a really simple process. It's two forms. It does have to be notarized, and then they send it back into us. Once we receive that paperwork, we put them in a database, and we send them a donor card. Um, when they pass away, we tell them to have that donor card um, ready uh, uh, to talk to their family about them wanting to donate so their family knows what their intentions are as well. That's very important. And they, when they pass away, their hospice nurse or their caregiver or their family member call our program. And then we make the necessary arrangements to have them picked up and bring him, them here to the School of Medicine. Um, they are chemically preserved. They stay in our program for about 18 to 24 months. And then we cremate them after we're done with our studies. And we can return them to the family member or whomever they indicate on their forms. 
We also have a place at Sunset Memorial Park here in Albuquerque on Edith and Manol that we can scatter their cremated remains at as well. So it's just kind of, it's pretty simple. Uh, if they just reach out to us and talk to us, each case is individual and we'd love to um, hear from them. Speaking of this journey, Alyssa and Devin, can you speak a little bit to um, what it's like for you to work with these donors, um, do you feel any particular connection or kinship to the uh, person whose body you're working on? So I think uh, you work with the, your donor for like over two months uh, and you go in a couple days of the week and you just are growing with, like growing as a medical student as you learn from them. And so I think that there is um, kind of a sense of cadaver lab being a rite of passage and so you kind of grow really fond of your donor which sounds kind of morbid but it's you're really just learning so much from them and you feel so grateful in that sense and at the end we're allowed to learn our donor's name and what they did for a living and you learn the amazing things that the donors did in their lifetime um and I think that for me personally, I felt a really emotional attachment to my donor and on the last day just held their hand and kind of had some tears of joy and gratefulness just to, uh, for that gift because it's the greatest gift that they could give is donating their body to us so that we can learn and become better physicians. And so I think you just are feel a sense of just how big that is. And so I think it just kind of comes in waves and just strikes you, but you really do get attached to your donors because it's just so special to be able to have that opportunity. That's really wonderful. Devin, is there anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, just to piggyback on Alyssa, I think you just have a real sense of gratitude towards them, especially when you're when you're finished um, with the course, because like Alyssa kind of said, you know, they they understood uh, their their donation would pay dividends for the long run for us. And I think making us more competent physicians is obviously something that we as medical students always, always want to, want to strive for. And I think starting medical school in this particular way is just something really special. And that's something that we will all cherish. Um, we'll never forget, especially going on into our careers. And I think from my perspective, going, being able to go back into the lab was something that I really wanted to feel that connection because we kind of were, we kind of didn't able, weren't able to get that. Um, so I thought it was really important to me personally, because I understood how important it was. And it was apparent working with the first years how much of an, of an impact it was having on them. So it was, it was nice to have some of that as well. I think that uh, it's hard to comprehend how much trust these donors give to us. And I think for our students, it's actually probably one of the first times that they have been entrusted in such a manner to care for somebody that is not a family member or somebody that they know. And I think because of that, it is really the beginning of their journey to, to their professional identity as physicians. And one of my students recently told me, which I think was kind of an incredible fact, that many of our donors donate when they're quite young. And a lot of our donors from this year donated or signed up for the program before many of our students were even born. And so they're trusting this process to people that may not have even been born. And yet this is like a huge step for their professional development. That is a really incredible perspective. Thank you for sharing it. So if someone did want to sign up for the program um, or learn more about it or how they might help, what can they do? Where can they go? Who do they call? Where are the forms that Amy mentioned? If you go to the unm.edu website, the main page, and in the search engine, do body donation. Um, our website will pop up and the forms that you can print are on the side. And then it talks in detail about our program and frequently asked questions that people may have. The other way to do it is to call our office 505-272-5555. And we will speak to them and we can mail out packets to them with the forms. Before we wrap up today, does anyone have any final thoughts they want to share um, about the program or the shortage or any of their thoughts or experiences? I think one of the things that came up um, and just started talking a lot about this issue over the past week that I think is interesting is that many of our donors are most often teachers. That's the most common 
uh, profession, which um, is not surprising because that's how they continue after life um, with our students. And then the age range um, is quite wide. I mean, you have to be at least 18 to donate, but we never, we don't usually get people who are under the age of 60, but the average age is around 80. And we've had quite a few over a hundred. And one other small um, thing to think about, which is a little bit, it's like a benefit of, of um, this program of participating is that it does defer the costs of um, funerals because um, the transportation to our department and the cremation is covered by the program if the, if the person does participate. And so even though we don't really want people to make that decision based on finances, it is one of the things that can be a benefit that people don't realize. Yeah, I think it's important to note the sort of multi-layered uh, realities of this of this program and how. I just want to reiterate, you know, from our perspective, how, how grateful we are to be able to learn in this way, um, to appreciate the complexity of a human body and is truly unique. And we can't thank our donors enough for what they've done for us. And we just hope that we don't let them down moving forward. Um, utilizing the gifts they provided for us. So I just wanted to know that to understand, just want everybody to understand how, how special that is to us as medical students, that their donation is, is paying dividends for us in the long run. Mm-hmm.